Well, thank you all for joining me for uh, session eight of 12 of Become a Millionaire. Desiderata by Max Ehrman. Go placidly amid the noise and haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even the dull and ignorant. They too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain and bitter. For always, there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interest in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs for the world is full of trickery, but let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself, especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years gracefully surrendering the things of youth, nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune, but do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond the wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have right to be here and whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul, with all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams. It is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. Max Ehrman. So um, the reason I chose this poem is I ran out of other poems, and I felt that this was a nice all-encompassing poem about life. And I want to know what the word desiderata means. So it means something that is needed or wanted. And then I looked up quickly what uh, the message behind this poem was. And uh, the answer that at least Google gave me was, the poem is about the authentic lifestyle, which involves loving oneself, being true to oneself, valuing one's employment, being dignified and self-assertive without being disrespectful to others. So that's my poem for this month. So the agenda for today is we'll quickly review our last month session, session seven. Then I'm going to complete CEO of job today. So what's exciting for me uh, at this session eight is I'm going to start finishing off some topics. So as of today, uh, you will get the entire CEO of job uh, um, presentation and uh, you can learn to get to 15% annual increases if you uh, follow, follow that, um, that strategy. And then I'm gonna do module three of buy a home, uh, which is cut expense 10%. So I'll be finishing buy a home as well, which is another exciting module that I'm bringing to a completion. And then I'm going to do expand wealth 20%. So this is the first time I'm delving beyond ETFs and into individual stocks. So this is more of an introduction, it's module one, and it's really just to get you started. Then I'll give you the usual uh, become a millionaire account update, and then we'll review the session. And then talk about the last four sessions of the year, which is uh, very exciting. So here we go. So last month we finished Expand Wealth 15%, which was a, a discussion about asset allocation. I talked about how you, know, you should um, put most of your money into equities in order to uh, ensure that you, you have the fastest path to getting to be, become a millionaire. Then I also re-ran the, the top 88 ETFs list and found some interesting changes and uh, that now becomes the new uh, ETF list you should work from. So that's uh, that's good. So you should be doing that every six months. 
And then we did the CEO of job 10%, which was uh, be excellent and be a leader. So we'll talk a little more about that today as well. And then last month, we talked about a module two of buy home, which was to get a mortgage. So we talked about credit scores, talked about what a mortgage broker does, what retail lenders do, and what debt to income ratios you needed in order to qualify for a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan. And for your homework, you were supposed to you know, look at session two and three on YouTube, uh, perform CDC and API for be excellent on your job, and then spend an hour with your band buddy um, presenting your be excellent CDC document. So let's move on to the meat of this month, which is Augment Income CEO of Job Module 3. So this, so here's the five steps to becoming CEO of your job. And I point out that this must be sequential. So you have to do step one, be competent before you do step two. And step one takes at least six months in order to create your, 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 your document about what it means to be competent and then to, to cycle through the, the various exercises until you feel you've met that goal. The next uh, step is to be excellent. That takes an additional six months. So by this time you're a year into it. And then the third step is to become a leader. So, so in order to be a leader, you have to be competent and you have to be excellent. No one's going to follow someone who is not uh, at the top of, of their job. So. You have to be a. Uh, you have to take about a year to reach that status within your department where you are a leader, you're a recognized leader in the group, and then we move on to today's topic, which is major improvement projects. So, after you've become a leader, you need to spend some time to find a major improvement project within your company or within your group, and really. Uh, try to lead a major improvement project. And then the last step is to uh, be involved or to lead multiple major improvement projects. So if you were able to do all five of these, you should average about 15% a year uh, in, terms of, in terms of your um, augment income. And this also assumes that uh, every three or four years you get a raise or you get a, a promotion and that comes with an additional raise. So you may not quite get the percentages that I've written, you know, next to uh, two, three, four, and five. So, you know, instead of 15%, you may be getting 12%, but then every three or four years, you may get an additional 10, 15% to get the average up to 15%. So as you can see, this takes close to four years to get to. And sometimes before you even get to step four or three, or five, you have been promoted to manage your position, which actually you know, changes your job. So you've got to start all over again. So being competent as individual contributor versus being competent as manager, two different scenarios. So um, anyways, you get to walk up this ladder and then you will enjoy 15% uh, uh, increase in income every year for you know, the, the period of time where you can maintain you know, uh, that uh, quality and quantity of work. So let's talk about what a major improvement project is. So I think of a major improvement project as something that gives you a minimum of 20% improvement in the group, in the organization, in the department. So one example of that would be, you know, if you're able to improve the output of the group by 20% at the same cost, so that would be a major improvement project. Or if you were able to decrease cost by 20% without reducing output, that works too. Or it could be a combination. You could be improving output by 10% and decreasing cost by 10%, or you could be increasing customer satisfaction by 20%. So these are just examples, but that's what I mean about um, leading and being involved in the major improvement project. So um, what I have here uh, are some examples of what I did when I was um, running PhD. Actually, I didn't do it. I actually um, had leaders within the group lead these projects. So the first one was we implemented an integrated uh, ERP system, which is an enterprise resource planning system that automated uh, recognizing revenue at the company. It automated the shipping of devices and returns 
while enabling customers to track their own shipments. So this was a major undertaking, took two, three years, but the rewards were enormous. Customers loved it. We actually got a lot of new customers and we got a lot of repeat business because of this capability. And then we also implemented a cloud-based customer support system. You know, before that, we were using an old style um, application and it just wasn't that effective, it wasn't that efficient. So we moved over to a cloud-based system that also took a couple of years to implement and that actually elevated our customer support significantly, uh, providing much better service for our customers. We also created a new reporting module where customers could actually create their own reports. So instead of needing us to build custom reports for them, they were able to create their own customer reports. And that was another thing that, uh, that probably took about nine months, but it was another um, customer delighter. So when we did that, customers were very pleased with our system. And then another thing we, we did was we actually took uh, some projects that took an average of 12 weeks. And by, by simplifying the process and by doing some things in parallel, we were able to take that tw those 12 week projects and bring it down to eight weeks. This was a major improvement for the company, it basically accelerated the time it took us to get things done by almost a third. So uh, again, uh, it, was a, it was a tremendous improvement, uh, reduced costs while increasing customer satisfaction. We also introduced a new co consulting service to our clients that strengthened um, the relationship we had with our customers while increasing revenue. So that's one of those that you know, both improved customer satisfaction and brought more revenue into the, the business. So what I've given you are examples of um, corporate jobs, because that's been most of my experience now. If you have a different type of job where you work in a restaurant or you work in something not so corporate, you can you should be able to find 20% improvement projects as well, but you gotta think about your, your situation and figure out what works for the job that you're at. So you know, my examples may not be the best, your, your situation is not in the corporation, but I'm sure you can, you can figure that out yourself. So what's the next step for this? So, you should begin thinking about potential ideas for major improvement projects in your company. So this is assuming that you already did the, the be competent, you've already done the be excellent, and you've already done the be leader. So you probably shouldn't necessarily go into this big time until you've achieved those first three steps because you're not really at a point in your career where you can be uh, thinking about these things. So which, with each idea seems strong, you should put together an outline of what the project might be, you know, what benefits are, what the costs are, and you know, how something like that would look. And then with these ideas, you should talk to friends and colleagues about your idea so they can help you think through the project. So you, know, you shouldn't have to figure everything out by yourself. It's good to get feedback as well as get input from your colleagues so that you can put together a, a, a more, um, comprehensive view on the project. Then at that point, you should try to put together a white paper on the project, which outlines the key benefits of the project. So this is really documenting what some of these ideas are. You should also find out what um, improvement ideas management are considering at the same time, because that's always helpful. And then you need to become very well versed in discussing you know, these projects and what the potential benefits and risks are. Um, make sure the risks and benefits can be quantified and measured because that's very important. And then you should try to get yourself you know, included in various departmental endeavors. So, and at some point you should speak to manage about, about your ideas of improvement and see if you can elicit some support. So these are just some ideas of how to get yourself involved in these um, major improvement projects at the company. So if you've completed the ideas in the previous slide, then yeah, most certainly within the company, you will start to be thought of as someone who um, is capable of you know, leading some major improvement projects within the company. And then if you successfully do one of these, you know, lead one of these projects uh, to fruition and you start getting some of the benefits that we discussed, then you will be asked to be involved in multiple improvement projects. So at that point, you should be consistently getting 
15% AIU increases. So most likely, you know, as you, you go through those five steps, you will get promoted several times you know, from individual contributor to senior individual contributor to manager to, to group manager. Um, so for your homework, you should do you know, a, a CDC and APA on be excellent. So the last month we did it on, you know, I'm sorry, on be a leader. I think I deleted the, the words and then um, put together an initial list of major improvement projects for your company. So those are the two um, homework items for, for uh, become CEO of your job. So again, when you complete these five steps, you will be CEO of your job and you should enjoy an average 15% increase you know, from that point on. So moving on to the next segment, uh, we're gonna talk about cut expense 10%, uh, which is a buy a home and we're going to work on module three, which is the home buying process. So just by way of, of um, review, uh, the three modules were your buy a home, which was introduction to the benefits, which I presented uh, you know, back in session four. And then last month we presented uh, getting a mortgage. And this month we're going to present how to buy a home. So those so when I finish today's module three, we'll have completed the buy a home module. So again, you know, by way of review, you know, buying a home is one of the most significant financial decisions you'll make in your life. And you know, depending on where you are, you know, you'll probably be purchasing a home somewhere between you know, a couple hundred thousand to five, six hundred thousand dollars, and it's a very big investment. And you know, most people will buy a home sooner or later. So uh, it's an important part of you know, getting to become a millionaire. Uh, most people who reach millionaire status have 10 to 25% of their net worth you know, in their home. So and that's an important component to getting there. So again, by way of review, so the benefits are A, you know, the, your home appreciates every year. B, you, know, you should be paying less than what you were paying when you were renting. Uh, and then C, you should be creating some tax benefits as we discussed. D, you should be paying off your principal, which adds to your net worth. And E would be ending rent increases. So um, I think you remember this buy home spreadsheet. So make sure that you know, as you go through this process that you use that spreadsheet to you know, put down your purchase price and you know, do the inputs A, B, C, D you know, through K and make sure you, you capture like you know, if you have a, a, you know, your property tax, your homeowner association, your private mortgage insurance, your, all the things that will contribute to your costs and use that spreadsheet to figure it out and just make sure that you can, uh, you can afford the down payment and then make sure that you can afford the monthly carrying costs. So uh, assuming that's true, We'll move on to the next section, which was which is to the process of buying homes. So, you should download a real estate app like Redfin, Zillow, or Trulia. You know they're all very similar, and you should create a search based on your buying criteria, such as you know what cities are you interested in, you know, what type of property, and what price range you're seeking. So, you know, example would be you would you know, search around Boston, look for condo, and this is your price range. And you should monitor the homes that you know, this, these real estate apps send you. They probably send you an email at least once a week with a list of homes that meet your criteria. And you should do this for three to six months just to get a feel for the market. You know, see what's available, see what the price range is, you know, see what the high end looks like, the low end looks like, and start to see what areas are more expensive. So. My, my um, advice to you is look for deals that are a good deal, which is it's at least 10% below market price. So, you know, I mean, you don't have to do this, but certainly if you were able to do that, you would, you would um, increase your net worth by almost 10% the day you close because you bought it below market price. And um, that's something to think about. Now, how do you, buy below market price. So this is a concept that you know, I've, I've, I've um, 
used and I've heard people talk about, but you really need to find a seller that's motivated. A motivated seller has the property on the market for a while, so they you know they want to move it. A motivated seller is someone that needs to sell their home. So they may have bought a new home already. They may be paying two mortgages. This person needs to sell their home quickly. You know, they can't afford to wait you know, six, nine months um, and pay two mortgages at the same time. So those people will be a little bit more you know, anxious to, to, to sell their home. So they may be more flexible. And then the other thing, things about the property that's limiting the market exposure, limiting the market interest. And is that something that you can deal with? If it is, you know, then that's also a motivated seller. So again, if the seller is motivated, then they will be much more flexible in price. So um, that's something to look out for. And I really ask you to, you know, don't fall in love with a home before you buy it. Because if you do fall in love with a home and you have to have it, you will most certainly end up paying more. So. I mean, if you fall in love, you can't help it, but you should try to refrain from that until you can get the kind of price and value that you're looking for. And finally, you should always buy the most expensive home that you can afford. So you know, if you can afford a $400,000 home, don't buy a $300,000 home because if you buy a $400,000 home, you're, it's the $400,000 that starts appreciating. So you will build your net worth more quickly if you can get the more expensive home. Now, finally, when you find a home that you like, always offer less than the asking price. Um, my recommendation is you offer between 10 to 20% less than the ask price, depending on how motivated the seller is. If the seller is really motivated, then I would go 20% less. If they're not really motivated, I would still give 10% less. If your offer is lower than the seller likes, you know, they will most certainly make a counter offer. So that's not a problem. If oh. Hello? Yeah. I just let you in. Yeah, thank you. I just let you in. That was my friend Peter. So he should be coming in in a second. Oh, good. So, um, so I'll always offer less than the asking price. If your office rejected, it, you can always make a higher offer. So um, you don't worry about don't worry about uh, offering too little. I always worry about offering too much. So you want to get that property at the lowest price possible. And you know, if you offer more than you need, then you'll end up paying more than you need. So. So just a summary of the buy a home three modules. You, know, you, you need to know the benefits of buying a home. Uh, you need to know that this is one of the best ways to grow your net worth is to buy a home. You should check your credit score and improve your credit score if you think that's necessary. It's always good to get pre-approval on your mortgage. It gives you a lot more leverage when, when you're making that offer. Uh, begin your search process early. I mean, you, you don't have to buy it. I mean, you could be looking for one or two years while you get a feel for the market. Um, be patient and buy your home. This is an important step to becoming a millionaire. So that completes the, the buy a home module. We did module one, two, and three, and that completes that. So that's cut expense 10%. So on to the the main topic for this much with this expand wealth 20% and we'll talk about individual stocks. So this is really more of an introduction to investing in individual stocks. So I've broken uh, this topic into three sections. One is what you need to know before you begin investing in individual stocks, what you need to know as you begin and what you need to know after you begin. So. We'll start with one, which is what you need to know before you begin. So just remember, you know, we, we started with expand worth 5%, which was uh, investing baby steps, gave you uh, the top 88 ETFs. <clears throat> and we focused on diversification through the use of ETFs. And we focused on time diversification by buying $100 each week. So that's part of what you need to always do is to, to you know, be, be diversify 
for use ETFs and then to diversify over time. And then when we went to 10%, we, we narrowed it down to the top 44. We introduced concepts of buying on a dip, explained how to create your own screener. And then we started investing $200 a week for 10 weeks uh, using you know, this enhanced strategy. So by the time you complete you know, the expand worth 10%, you have invested $3,000 and you should be seeing at least 10% annual return. And then we went to expand wealth 15%, which is uh, the used retirement account to expand your wealth so you didn't have to worry about you know, paying taxes on your gain. We also talked about harvesting losses as a way to minimize capital gains on your, on your non-retirement accounts. So at this time, I want you to rename your Become a Mania account to your BAM ETFs, because we're also going to create an account called BAM stocks in order to start talking about individual stocks. So do not start expand wealth 20% until you've mastered expand wealth 15%. That's very important. And that means achieving 15% return annually, you know, using the ETFs at least 75% of the time. And then you should also ramp up your investment. So at this point, you may, you're, you, you're, you're probably by the end of August or September, you would invest at $3,000. You figure how much money you have. And if you've been saving your know, 10, 15% of your, your income you know, every month, you know, you, you've got a nice little nest egg that you've, you've built up. So you should then uh, invest no more than 2% of a week you know, to put that money to work. Again, that's basically diversifying. So that, that would take a year to put that money to work. So if you have $10,000, you should invest $200 per week and that will take 50 weeks to put that amount of money to work. So today we'll begin uh, the expand wealth 20% and expand wealth 25% module and we'll start talking about individual stocks. So if you can get to the 15%, you'll, you'll be poised to become a millionaire. So at this time, it's important to take a step back and take a pause, right? You know, if you stick to investing in ETFs only and get 15% average annual return, you will be doing better than 98% of the investors in the world. Let me repeat. If you do 15% per year on average, you're doing better than 98% of the investors in the world. So that's pretty good. The system that I teach works pretty well. It's got a you know, pretty good return, 15%. And the risk is there, but it's modest. For most people, this is a great result. It's a very important life skill that can make the difference between just getting by and actually becoming wealthy. You know, the person who you know, has no return versus the person who has 15% return is enormous. You cannot achieve 15% consistently with ETFs, then you're not ready to invest in individual stocks, okay? So let me now move into the next phase, which is to compare 15% annual return, which you can get with ETFs, versus 25% annual return, which you could get if you get going to individual stocks. So if you invested $1,000 and received 15% for 15 years, you would get $8,000. So it's eight times that money. In 30 years, that would be $64,000. So $15,000 invested for 30 years would give you a million dollars. So that's a pretty amazing compound annual growth that's created with something like, um, you know, the ETF strategy I've put forward. If you want to get to 20, 25%, then you have to invest in individual stocks. You just can't get there with ETFs because it's too diversified. There are many ways to invest in individual stocks. So you know, I'll share an approach that I believe works. Uh, this is much more difficult than the ETF strategy and it requires you have a lot more knowledge and a lot more insight. And you need to know a lot more things. So it requires that you do more research. It takes more time to do the research. It 
takes more time to track the individual investments. It's also riskier, meaning the probability that you will lose money is much higher. Um, but if you do master these skills and you get the 25%, this is what you can look forward to. So if you have $1,000 at 25% for 15 years, that would be worth $28,000 in 15 years. In 30 years, that $1,000 becomes $784,000 if you can grow 25% a year for 30 years. If you had $15,000 that you invested for 30 years at 25%, that would be worth over $11 million. So that's that's the difference between 15% and 25%. You're getting a million versus getting 11 million. So now that I've gotten you excited, let's talk a little bit about um, individual stocks. So there's a total of 7,821 individual stocks. So I used the stock screener to find the stocks with the best 10-year return and the worst 10-year returns. They're just like I did with ETFs. It turns out only 5,700 stocks have a 10-year history, meaning that there's 2,000 stocks that are um, more recent IPOs, less than 10 years, so they don't have 10 years history. So uh, the analysis I did was on the 5,700 stocks. So if you look at the best 10-year return, here's the, the top seven companies. Um, the, the best one is this company called Xpel. I've never heard of it, but they have had a 108% annual return for 10 straight years. So basically, 100% is doubling. So they basically double their value for 10 straight years. Now, the one company, the two companies I recognize here is actually Tesla, which is the electric car company, and NVIDIA, which is a, a which is a um, video graphics card company. So just to show you what it looks like, I've, I've got uh, the chart for Tesla. So 10 years ago, Tesla, was worth $5 a share. So if you bought it for, for 10 years ago for $5, that $5 share is now worth $687. So if instead of buying one share, you bought 1,000 shares, that $5,000 would now be worth $687,000. So that's what you see in this kind of chart that, uh, in fact, they've, they've, they've dropped a little bit, but uh, that's what it looks like to do like 60% per year for 10 years. I looked at the other end of the spectrum, which was the, the worst uh, companies in terms of return. So the worst company was this Cherubim, never heard of it, but they basically lost 95% of their value every year for the last 10 years. So, um, I, I actually took a closer look at Strike Force the way I looked at Tesla. So this company lost 92% of its value every year oh, let me get some, can I, for, for 10 straight years. So this is what this looks like. So this was a company that um, it one share stock would have been worth hundred million dollars and that hundred million dollars is now worth four and a half cents. Now obviously the stock wasn't worth hundred million dollars. What they did was they did a lot of splits. So it's probably worth like hundred dollars and they probably split you know 20, 30 times. So the value of stock 10 years got got restated to a hundred million dollars. That hundred million dollars is now worth 40 four and a half cents. That's what it's like to basically lose all your money. So I show you this to show you the volatility, both on the positive in terms of, you know, like a Tesla or a company that, that, that doubled every year for 10 years. And then the, the you know, obviously the company that, that didn't do so well, which basically lost 99.9999% of its value in 10 years. So just to compare ETFs to stocks. So if you look at a 10 year return, the best 10-year return stock was 24% per year for 10 years. And the, the worst ETF was losing 48% a year for 10 years. The best stock was 108% for 10 years. And the worst stock was losing 95% per year for 10 years. 
So rather than just look at the extreme, I decided to look at like an average of five because you know, looking at just the, the one extreme is probably too extreme. So if you average the top five ETFs, that would be a 22% return. If you average the worst five ETFs, that would be a 24% loss per year for 10 years. And if you look at the top five stocks, uh, it would be growing 72% a year for 10 years. And the worst one would be losing 91% a year for 10 years. So now I think you can start to see more concretely what I mean when I say, uh, you know, the, there's a lot more rewards, you know, you get the 72%, but you get much higher risk. So, you know, this guy lost 91% of its money every year for 10 years. So um, just looking at this column. So basically there's 700 ETFs that have a 10 year history of the 22.99. And as I said in the early slide, there's 5,700 that have a 10 year history of the 7,821. So in investing in individual stocks is really finding, you know, the handful of stocks of the 7,821 that you think will give you a better return than the 15% you can get with ETFs. So again, some caveats before you invest in individual stocks. You know, the first thing you should do is uh, don't just jump in. Don't just start investing. Always you know, test your strategy, your strategies in the test account before investing significant capital. That's what we did with ETFs. Your, your Become a Mania account was a test account. And we just put 1,000 initially, then you know, 3,000 later. But it was really a way to test out the strategy. I estimate that to make 15% uh, consistently with individual stocks is three to four times harder than it is to make 15% with ETFs. So three to four times more work, three to four times more risk, um, just three to four times you know, everything. So uh, always have your strategy written down. So you know, don't just go do something, write it down always create a new account for each different strategy. I have about 20 different accounts and each account is tied to a particular strategy. So I know whether that strategy works or not. And always, always test your strategy for at least six months before you ramp up. You put a thousand, two thousand dollars in, you follow your strategy, see if it works. If it works, then you can slowly expand what you put in the account. So that was all before you begin investing. So let's talk about what you do as you begin. So remember I said that you have know a lot more. Well, indeed, you have know a lot more. So if you're going to invest in individual stocks, you have to know things about you know, how the global economy is doing, how unemployment is doing, what the Federal Reserve's outlook is, you know, what the interest rates are, you know, legislation in Congress, and so much more. So you really have to have a good feel for, you know, things going in the global market. Major recessions are generally driven by some of those topics up there. So you need to follow those because if you don't, you, you're going to be you know, surprised and, and you will, will not be very happy. Um, so examples are like obviously 9-11 in 2001. I mean, that was a, that was a three year uh, uh, recession before the market came back. Uh, the, the financial crisis 2008, that was also uh, probably like a 12 to 18 month a downturn. And then we all, you know, if you're old enough, you remember the oil prices uh, back in the 70s. It used to be 25 cents a, a gallon and it went up to like uh, you know, 80, 90 cents a gallon. And that caused uh, a major recession in the stock market. So that's macro news that you have to know for almost any stock you invest in because you need to know how that affects what you do. And then you need to follow both uh, industry and sector news. Uh, and you also have to follow uh, what the competitors are doing because that all can impact the stock that you're covering. So I just have a couple of simple examples. So, so Google decided this was about uh, nine months ago to make it harder for Android apps to track you once you've opted out. So there are certain stocks that really rely on that tracking in order to do a good job you know, presenting the right ads, et cetera. And uh, stock symbols like TTD, which is Trade Desk and MGNI, 
were impacted, you know, 20, 25% because of what Google did. So these are the types of things that you have to follow so that you can understand how these things happen and you can try to you know, avoid some of those problems. Uh, so my next example is just a few days ago, you know, Amazon came out with their quarterly results. This was maybe three or four days ago. And Amazon's results were negative. And, you know, I mean, Amazon took like a 10% you know, hit of stock. Now, because, you know, Amazon is the big dog in e-commerce, all the other e-commerce stocks took a hit as well, like eBay, Etsy, Wayfair. You know, they did fine. Nothing happened. But because Amazon did poorly, that dragged out all the e-commerce stocks. So that's why you need to, to just be on top of, you know, sector and industry news. And the last example is, you know, Apple, you know, their, their latest uh, iOS 14 said that all apps that engage in tracking have to show a prompt that allows users to opt out. Again, so that negatively affects Facebook and many, many other apps. So you, know, you need to, to stay on top of what's happening in the sector in order to you know, be a, a, a good um, invest of individual stocks. And then what do you need to know two of two? So we talked about the macro news, we talked about the sector news, and then you have to know even more about the company itself. So things like what we call company fundamentals, you know, how profitable is it? What are the revenues? You know, what are the assets, liabilities? How fast are they growing? You know, what's the market potential? What do you know about the CEO? What do you know about management? These are all important factors in understanding whether you want to invest in the stock or not. And then every quarter, these companies you know, announce their quarterly earnings, which uh, you know, shares a lot of updates on that information. So that's something you have to follow closely. And then you also have to follow significant company news, you know, things like you know, the company needs to raise money, you know, that's something you need to know, the class action lawsuits, you know, are they buying companies or are they a target uh, for acquisition? So these, the significant company news affects the stock's price, you know, both positively and negatively. And then finally, there are many, many analysts out there and they're constantly following certain companies. You know, a company like Apple probably has, you know, 100 different companies that follow them. And... You know, they are constantly doing uh, upgrades, meaning you know they, uh, the company's doing well and they upgrade the stock, or the company's not doing well, they downgrade stock. All of these analyses will either bolster, you know, raise up the price of stock, or it will detract from the stock. So, you know, knowing the stuff is very important, and you have to follow it closely. So that's there's a lot more work in individual stocks than with ETFs. With ETFs, it was more of a, a high level view of the market. Now you have to get down and dirty and really know all the details of the particular company you're, you're following. So we've seen this chart several times. This is the S&P over the last 90 years. So the good news is that when you invest in individual stocks, you get the same wind in your back as ETFs. So you know that that you know, 8% a year for the last 90 years also applies to individual stocks. Um, you know, again, you know, the last 10 years, the last five years, the last year, you know, shows you know, 11, 12, and 16%. So that also applies to individual stocks. So that's the good news. I mean, you, you know, the market itself is going in a positive direction. Let me show you a, a little video from um, Investopedia that talks about fundamental analysis. That's an important part of Fundamental analysis is a method of valuing securities such as stocks and bonds that attempts to discover their true value by examining related economic and financial factors. Tom uses fundamental analysis to manage his portfolio. He is considering buying more stock in either Ed's Carpets or Al's Ice Cream. Tom goes through the financial statements for both companies. He looks at the debt loads, margins, price multiples, book value, cash flow, and many other metrics. He uses ratios to analyze the numbers and compare them to numbers from similar stocks. Tom even visits the stores in his area and talks to managers to see how both companies operate. Tom discovers that according to his analysis, 
Al's ice cream is overvalued by the market, and Ed's carpet is undervalued. Tom buys more shares of Ed's carpet and sells his shares of Al's ice cream. For stocks, fundamental analysis involves sifting through the company's financial statements and other information to establish an intrinsic or true value. Then, an investor can compare the intrinsic value to the market value of the company's stock when making buy or sell decisions. So that's a nice little video that talks about fundamental analysis. So the question is, how do you find good stocks? Um, so what I decided to do is look at the uh, you know, experts that are acknowledged to be the best investors of all time. So I took the list from Investopedia. And so my goal is to make you more knowledgeable in investing, not to make you an expert, because uh, I'm not sure that's possible. There's many ways to find individual stocks. So I'm just giving you some ideas for you to think about. For those who just want the answer, you know, I'll try my best, but ultimately uh, I'll mostly provide food for thought and you just have to think for yourself. Uh, remember, there are no right answers because you never know beforehand whether the stock is going to do well or not. But there are wrong answers because sometimes you know you can you can see that this is not a good investment, so you want to avoid those. So greatest investors of all time. So number one is a guy by the name of Benjamin Graham. It's this guy here, and he was both an investment manager and a financial educator. And he wrote two books: one called Security Analysis and Value Investing. And probably most impressive was he was Warren Buffett's professor. So Warren Buffett, you know, learned about investing from Benjamin Graham. So he's quite quite a um, well-known person. The next person is uh, John Templeton. He basically uh, was called the greatest global stock picker of the century. And you know, he ran Templeton Funds, which he sold to Franklin Group in 1999. Now, Thomas Rowe who I don't have a picture of, uh, he's the father of growth investing. So growth investing is a style of investing that you know, many, many uh, people do today. So you're basically buying companies that grow rapidly, and that's what he focused on. And he really focused on good companies for the long term. So um, you'll hear this theme repeated over and over again, because that's you know, one of the... the um, one of the things that that most investors talk about is to focus on the long term. You, it's hard to know what the company will do next week, next month, or even next year. But if it's a good company, you'll know they'll do well in five or ten years. And then finally, uh, top right, this, this gentleman here, he ran the Windsor Fund for 31 years, and he earned 13.7 percent turn uh, return for 31 years. So. Remember I said 15% would be better than 98% of investors out there? Well, this person who's considered one of the best investors of all time only did 13.7. So um, if you invested with him you know, in the beginning of his career, you know, your money would have grown 53 times. So that's that's pretty impressive. So you know, if you get you, you, you put down $10,000, uh, $10, that would have grown to $530,000 in uh, in 31 years. So just a little more about Benjamin Graham. So he wrote these two books, you know, the first is Security Analysis, he wrote that in 1934, and Intelligent Investor in 1949. So his investment philosophy is really, you know, to really understand investor psychology. And he talks about Mr. Market, and Mr. Market is really the stock market. And he's a person that's either you know, extremely happy, so if the market's going well, he's thrilled, and he he basically uh, drives up the prices of the stocks because he's so happy, he, he wants to buy everything. Or he's depressed, and he wants to sell everything, which lowers the price. So um, this investor psychology of, of Mr. Market uh, is someone who's always sort of overshooting the market. So. You have to you know, not you have to not uh, fall into that trap. 
Uh, Benjamin Graham teaches the buy and hold strategy. Again, that, that fits in with the long-term investing. He's a big proponent of fundamental analysis, which that video was about. And he talks about this concept of margin of safety. So if a stock is priced $100 a share, and after you do your um, analysis of the what they call the intrinsic value, and you think that the company is worth $130 a share, that means you have a 30% margin of safety. So that's what uh, Benjamin Graham uh, recommends is that you find stocks that have a 30% margin of safety before you buy it. So that even if you're wrong by 20%, you'll still do fine. And finally, he talks about this concept of investment versus speculation. So investment is one where you do thorough analysis, you know, like we talked about, that promises safety of principle basically means that you, know, you won't lose your, your money and while you also get an adequate return. So if you don't do that thorough analysis that gives you your know, safety of your principle, which is that margin of safety and get a, a nice you know, 20, 25% return per year, then you're really speculating. So that's the way he describes it. So number five through eight here. So uh, I don't know much about this Jesse Livermore. They just said he was self-made man. I don't know who he is. But the next guy, this gentleman here is Peter Lynch. He's very well known. So he ran Fidelity's Magellan Fund from 1977 to 1990, basically 13 years. And he got a 29% annual return, which is extremely impressive. I mean, very impressive. Uh, George Soros, not a picture, but he's more of a, a he ran a hedge fund and he was a short-term speculator. And then we have uh, Warren Buffett here, who is uh, known as the Oracle of Omaha. You know, he's probably considered it the most successful investor in history. You know, he's the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. And if you invested a thousand dollars with Warren Buffett in 1965, see, so that's uh, 35, 45, 50. So it's about yeah, 55, 60 years ago. Yeah, long time ago. That would be worth $16.5 million. $1,000 is worth $16.5 million. So that's extremely impressive. So a little more about uh, Warren Buffett. Um, he follows the, the Benjamin School of Value Investing. So he, he really follows what um, Benjamin Graham teaches uh, he calls, he talks about looking for securities that are unjustifiably low based on intrinsic value. Again, that's the kinds of margin of safety. So he's basically saying that, you know, if um, the price of stock is low, let's say the $100 compared to its intrinsic value, which is 130, that's what you look for. And intrinsic value is often estimated by analyzing company fundamentals. So what Warren Buffett looks for in a company is uh, obviously the company's performance. That's uh, number one. It has to grow. It has to be profitable. It has to be growing profits. Um, he looks at company debt, which is also very important that the company is not strapped in too much debt. You know, some companies borrow a lot of money and can't pay it back. He looks at things like profit margins, which is uh, very important. Uh, he looks at whether the company is public or available to um, sold to the public. And then this concept he calls commodity reliance. It's called like economic moat or competitive advantage. So the idea is moats are things around the castle. So basically if you have an economic moat, it means it prevents competitors from attacking you. So if you think about a couple like Amazon, you know, when they, a few years ago, decided to do free shipping for, for Amazon Prime customers. You know, that created a bit of an economic moat. Um, you know, most other companies cannot afford to do free shipping. So when Amazon was able to do that, I think they, they locked a lot of competitors. And it's one of the reasons why they've continued to grow. So that's just one example. Um, and then finally, is it cheap? Meaning, you know, is, there a, is, is it a stock that is selling for a lot less than it's worth? That's uh, what Warren Buffett believes in. In terms of Peter Lynch, so here's his nine investment tips. So the first thing he talks about is 
In stocks, most important organ is the stomach, not the brain. Meaning that you know, if you have the stomach for the market going down and you end up selling when the market goes down, then, then you will get hurt. So you really have to have a strong stomach and be able to, to bear the downturns in the market. His next uh, advice is to buy only what you know and understand. So he avoids things that he doesn't understand. So for me, I don't invest in crypto because I don't understand crypto. So that's that's my example for, for not investing things I don't understand. Uh, don't be intimidated, and that's very important. Do your research. So a lot of people talk about that. You know, do your homework. You know, make sure you understand the ins and outs of every company. Understand their gray areas. You know, meaning things are not always black and white. So you know there are times you have to make judgment calls, and that's that's very important to being successful. Look behind the obvious. Consider mutual funds expect losses and be patient. So those are the nine things that Peter Lynch talks about in his book. Jack Bogle, who's a real hero of mine, you know, he's uh, the top picture. You know, he started the Vanguard Group in 1975. So he pioneered no load mutual funds, which was uh, mutual funds that, that uh, they didn't charge when you, you bought it. And he's also a champion of low cost in, uh, index investing, so ETFs. He introduced the first index fund in 1976. So this is a person who really believes in, in um, putting together index funds for investors to, to buy. Uh, this uh, Carl Icahn, who was a corporator, and William Gross, who uh, was famous for, for bonds. So that brings us to this slide, which is, uh, so actually that completes the introduction to uh, investing in individual stocks. I will talk more about this, uh, you know, the, the, the rest of the last four sessions, but uh, this gives you an introduction to this topic. So moving on to um, where we are. So as you can see, we've done augmented income through 20%. We've done cut expenses through 15%. We've done expand wealth through 20%. So there's only four more of these cells to complete and you will have you know, completed the course. So good for you. Congratulations to everybody. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Become a Millionaire account. So basically I did this on uh, 10 a.m. on July 29th, it was like a few days ago. And as you can see, I sorted this by total income, uh, to total gain percentage. So basically I have uh, this IHI, which is the medical device at 12%. Socks, which I've always talked about at 12%, which is not bad. Uh, this is actually the absolute return, not the annualized return. Uh, XSD, which is also a semiconductor uh, ETF. Uh, you can see here, I bought 300 worth. Here, I've only bought 100 worth. And then with IGV, which is a, um, it's really a, a software high-tech ETF, done very well. Uh, and almost 11%. Uh, Vanguard, uh, which is at 10%. QQQ, which follows the NASDAQ at 9%. PSI at 5 PSJ at 1%. And uh, this is a biotech one that's down 1.5%. So I'm actually very pleased with this return. You know, I've gotten about 7% year to date. And Looking again at this chart, where you can see, uh, you know, I invested a thousand dollars initially. You know, then there was, I was down three percent, up eleven, up seventeen, up nine. You see, it it uh, bounces around a lot. Then to twenty, and then uh, it was a fourteen percent at ten a.m. on ten twenty nine, and then on on uh, August second, which was yesterday, it got as high as fifteen percent and. Still way behind the S&P, which is in the 30s, but very close to the NASDAQ, which is 18 and 17%. So I'm actually quite pleased because this is only the 10% strategy and I'm, I'm actually enjoying 15%. So what'd you learn today? So we completed CEO of job module. We uh, began the expand wealth 20% journey and we did buy home module three, the buying process. 
So for your homework, you should probably go back and review sessions four and five on YouTube. Uh, do uh, CDC and API for be a leader on your job. Spend an hour with your, your band buddy, you know, going over that and then begin to put your list of potential significant improvement projects for your department. And that completes today's session. And as you can see, your next month we'll do uh, augment income 25% and expand wealth 20%. And then you got a few more sessions to go. So we're almost done. Congratulations. Okay, that completes today's session. I am open to uh, your thoughts, comments, feedback. Let me see, let me stop sharing. Okay, here we go. Hey, Mary. Hey. Did you unmute? You did unmute. No, I, I unmuted myself already. Yeah, you did. I... Everyone should unmute themselves so we can talk. <clears throat> what do you think, Mary? It, it's a very, very dense uh, session with a lot of, lot of information. Yeah, a lot of content. A lot of information. Good information. But we're getting to the end, so I'm trying to cram everything in. No, no, you you, you explained it very well. Uh, I like to see all those rich people, how they got so rich. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the history they is very interesting. People. They are rich people. Mm. Thank you. Lynn? Yes, it's a lot of information um, to digest, but it's... Inquiring minds want to know because it's a lot of information that I'm really interested in and want to know about mortgages and the housing. And no, I think it's it's really useful stuff and I'll watch it again to go through and absorb everything. No, I, it's really, it's useful. You present it very well because I think for a lot of people, some of those things, it's not always easy to digest, but you make it approachable, so. Thank you. Hey, Lisa Ann. How is that I these days? Exploding emoji mind. <laughs> <laughs> exploding emoji mind. <laughs> I use it at work a lot when my supervisor. It's like a, it's a, it's an emoji and it's going boom. But um, no, lots of good information. Just it's good that you record it so we can go back and view them because you have to. It takes a little time to absorb everything, which is fine. I mean, I love learning, so I mean, I that's, this is awesome. So. Good Thank information. You. Just keep looking forward to each session. So I really appreciate it. We're, we're winding up, Lisa, and only four more. I and hey, you know what? I've spent more time with you than I have members of my family. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Peter. You're gonna show us your face, Peter. Uh, Peter's a, Peter's not there. Charlene. Are you there? I am there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you? Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Bye -bye. For... Thank you. For... Is that your baby? It is. It is. My apologies. Oh. I'm going to put myself back on mute. But yes, thank you for having this session. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I learned a lot as well in terms of stocks and just thinking about things a bit differently. So thank you for that. Thank you. Peter, are you there? Peter's not there. Well, that completes today's session. So look forward to seeing you on next month. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.